Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's BU Live interview, The Business of Writing and Publishing. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm a member of the Career Programs Team in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's event is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered to our 346,000 alumni around the globe and all of our current students. Throughout your career, BU is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. And we aim to do this by providing everyone with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. Again, I know we have alumni and students joining us today from some very far away places. I think we have uh, 14 countries around the world represented and alumni and students in at least 31 US states. Please know everybody that we really do appreciate your participation in this and every program that we offer. Before I introduce today's speakers, I have just two brief housekeeping notes for you. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website, which you can find at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speakers today are very eager to answer any questions that you may have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A function on Zoom. Again, hover over your screen, find your Zoom toolbar. You're gonna to wanna to select the uh, option that says Q&A, and you can go ahead and type your question in at any time. We'll also keep an eye on the chat if you'd rather put your question in there. Um, but now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the day. Uh, this is a first of its kind event for me. I'm very thankful for my colleague, uh, Jackie, who introduced me to our interview subject for today, Diana Rodriguez Wallach. Diana is a multi-published author of young adults, or uh, as they say in the biz, I think YA novels. Her most recent Small Town Monsters is um, a, uh, excuse me, let me make sure we show that. One second. Um, her most recent is, uh, Small Town Monsters, a young adult Latinx horror novel that will publish in the fall of 2021 through Random House's underlined imprint. Diana is also the author of the Anastasia Phoenix series, a trilogy of young adult spy thrillers. The first book in the series, Proof of Lies, has been optioned for film. Congratulations on that, Diana. Uh, and was also chosen as a finalist at the 2018 International Thriller Awards for Best Young Adult Novel. Bustle listed her, listed her as one of the top nine Latinx authors to read for Women's History Month in 2017, and Paste named Proof of Lies one of the top 10 best young adult books for March 2017. Diana, thank you so much for being here today. You and I had originally talked about you doing um, a, a presentation of your own uh, mm -hmm. about the publishing and writing process, and you actually had the great idea um, to include a student that had reached out to you. And so would you mind introducing our student interviewer for us? Yes, yeah, so I'm not a typical PowerPoint presentation person. So this Q&A format is way easier for me and Saskia just happened to have reached out at the perfect time. So originally from Madison, Wisconsin, Saskia Denbone is a current sophomore pursuing a dual degree in English and vocal performance at BU's College of Fine Arts. She loves creative writing and hopes to become a children's book editor in the future. Her current work in progress is an illustrated manuscript called Project Mountain Down that teaches kids about environmental issues. Saskia also dabbles in playwriting as well as composing operas and musicals. In addition, Saskia interns at, is it Juventus? Mm -hmm. I Yes, a new music ensemble, serves as the vice president of Boston University Treblemakers, an acapella group, and volunteers as the founder and chair of the publicity committee for BU's choral department. She is also learning to speak Dutch. I, again, I'm super excited for this. Thank you so much, but thank you both so much uh, for spending time with us today. Saskia, uh, you've been a super impressive student, but would you mind sharing the, the story about how you found Diana and how the two of you connected? And then the floor is all yours. I hope you'll take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm super excited to be here. And thank you, Diana, for the lovely introduction. Um, so last summer, I was trying to figure out kind of what career path was right for me, especially trying to reach out to writers and editors. So I basically went to the Career Advisory Network on BU's website and was kind of just like perusing through all of the alums and found Diana. And so I reached out through email. Um, and unfortunately, at that time, we weren't able to figure out a time that worked for both of us. So um, Diana actually invited me to this um, earlier in the year, but we only figured it out a little later, closer to the time. 
Um, but yeah, so now we're basically gonna just like go ahead and do what we would have done in a talk, um, in the talk that we had planned last summer. So I'm going to be asking some questions that I came up with at that time, um, as well as some questions that I recently came up with. And then we're gonna move into a Q&A so you guys can ask some questions as well. Um, so are we all good to start with some yeah. questions then? Let's awesome. do it. All right. So. Um, my first question is, um, have you come across any barriers in the industry as a female Latina author writing Latinx works? Yes, <laughs> short answer. But no, that's a great question because you can basically frame my whole career based on my Latinx identity, interestingly enough. Um, obviously, looking at me, I don't look like the typical stereotype that one associates with the last name Rodriguez. I am aware of this fact. I've got, you know, the pale skin and the red hair and the freckles. Um, and that was a big impact on me growing up and, you know, how connected I felt to my Latinx identity. So when I wrote my first novel, actually both of my first two novels featured just a white female young adult protagonist. And they landed me my first agent, but neither of those books went on to sell to a publisher. So my agent at the time turned to me when those books had failed and said, hey, you know, I'm seeing a big uptick in editors wanting multicultural books. Do you have any ideas? And this was back in 2007. So this was long before the diversity movement in publishing started. And I talked to her, I kind of talked a little about my upbringing and what I felt comfortable writing. And ultimately what I came up with was um, my debut, which is Amor and Summer Secrets, which is about a girl who is half Polish and half Puerto Rican, like I am, who's growing up in the Philadelphia suburbs, who has reddish hair and freckles and doesn't speak Spanish and feels kind of disconnected from that side of herself. And then is forced to spend the summer in Utuado, Puerto Rico, which is where my dad grew up. So this is obviously all drawn from my life experience down to when she gets to Puerto Rico, she meets all of these relatives who look exactly like her. They have pale skin and light hair and freckles. And that was a true story based on my first trip to Puerto Rico, meeting my relatives there. And that experience, you know, personally, when I went to Puerto Rico, kind of connected me more with my Latin roots because all of a sudden what was my barrier, which was how I felt like I looked and didn't fit in, no longer was there. And so More and Summer Secrets came out um, and it was well received by the Latinx community. You know, it was, it placed in the International Latino Book Awards and everything was great. And then I had to come up with my next novel. And I didn't realize, I didn't have a good grasp of publishing at the time, I was very new. And I didn't understand that when I came out with a Latinx debut, that there was an expectation that I would probably continue along that vein. Mm -hmm. But for me at the time, I thought, well, I wrote my big Puerto Rican, you know, homage to my father's family. Let me write a book to my mother's Polish side. So I came up with this whole idea for a book that would you know, a young adult spy thriller that would go all through Europe and land in Poland in the Czech Republic. And it's actually based on a professor from BU at the time I had met his name and I, hold on, I pulled out his book. Um, Lawrence Martin Bittman or Ladislav Bittman was his original name. He was a professor at BU, a journalism professor, but before that he had been the deputy director of disinformation for Czechoslovakia during the Cold War. And his goal was to make reporters think that the Nazis still existed and were up to no good. So no one would be paying attention to what the communists were doing over here. And he was very good at it until there was like a death warrant on his head and he fled to America, ends up at BU in the College of Communication teaching journalism students how to tell when they're being fed false information. So, I mean, I was a journalism student and I remembered his story and I believe in the whole write what you know thing. And so that's how I came up with the concept for Anastasia Phoenix. Um, and it, it just featured just a white character, you know, going through Europe goes out on submission and we get rejections, ton of, tons of them. You know, and it ultimately took me seven years to finally get Proof of Lies um, into print. And it was a very long process. And one of the things that we kept hearing from editors when they were passing was, I'm surprised the main character isn't Latina. 
And I'm not saying it was the only reason they passed. I mean, there was a lot of problems with the book, hence the seven years of revision, but we heard it often enough that my former agent at the time actually asked me like, hey, you know, would you consider making her Puerto Rican? It might open up some doors. And I didn't want to do it, you know, and, and it wasn't because I was being like stubborn. It was just sort of, I didn't see that as a vision of the book right. that I wanted it to be like this female Jason born in Europe. And so then she asked, like, would you consider a pen name? You know, maybe if you take the Rodriguez out of your name, you know, it would change the expectations from editors who are reading it and they wouldn't expect this multicultural character. And the same thing was no. I mean, and that was just for purely selfish reasons that I had worked so hard on this book. I was going to see my name on it, you know, whenever it came out. And it did. You know, I stuck to my guns and the book came out in 2017. And interestingly enough, it was just as well received by the Latinx community as Amor and Summer Secrets ever was. You know, as Jeff mentioned, I was listed on like Latinx authors to read for Women's History Month. I was on the cover of Aldea newspaper in Philadelphia with like my giant picture on the on the thing. I mean, it was an interesting experience that the Latinx community didn't care that my main character was white. They cared that I am Puerto Rican and I published a book mm -hmm. and that's what they wanted to celebrate. And so then I had to decide the same thing. What am I going to write next? You know what I mean? And I had made a conscious decision at that point that my next book would feature, you know, a multicultural character and probably most of my books will. And it's for a variety of reasons. One of them was, in 2017, when Proof of Lies came out, it was also the same year as Hurricane Maria. And my family put a lot of time and energy and money into helping our family on the island who had lost their houses. We raised funds to rebuild it. And I even reached out to BU people. I had a, a BU alum who I had met only once reached out to an alum that he knows who lived on the island who brought food from her own kitchen to my cousin's house, who was blind and diabetic and couldn't leave the house after the hurricane. So, I mean, it was just a, such a harrowing experience that I felt way more connected to my Puerto Rican roots after that. Mm -hmm. And additionally, a lot of time passed. You know, when I published Amor and Summer Secrets, I was less than 30 years old. I hadn't come into myself, you know what I mean? Like I really did feel like Mariana that I was disconnected from my roots. The first blog I ever wrote as an author was, hi, my name, my name's Diana and I'm a closeted Latina because <laughs> I am so well aware of the white privilege that comes with how I look that I will never be pulled over for being, you know, too brown or something like that. So I felt like that meant I was not Latina enough you know, to, to claim that identity. And now, you know, I'm in my early forties. I I'm grown as they say, and I am more accepting of both sides of who I am and feel like, you know, I have less to prove in that regard, but also, you know, I now realize that that box that I was put in, you know, that YA Latinx box, when I was getting those rejections, I initially presented the box and felt like I was being told what I had to write and that I could only write this one story. And now I see the box a little differently. You know, I see it as, you know, something that needs to get bigger to encompass more Latinx authors. And I also see the need for, you know, multicultural teens or Puerto Rican teens out there to see themselves on the page, mm -hmm. which is why I'm now choosing, you know, I'm not being forced to, but choosing to write Latinx characters. My next book that comes out, Proof of, I mean, Small Town Monsters, is two points of view, a, a girl and a boy. They're both multi multicultural. They're both Latinx. The girl is Puerto Rican and Irish because I now feel like I want as many teens as possible to see themselves on the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, writing what you know, um, which it seems like you're you're very, very good at doing. Um, so for people like me who are very, very, very white, but still feel that it's really important that when we're writing stories, we show um, different characters from all racial and um, ethnic backgrounds. Um, what is is that something that we are able to do? And if so, how do we do that? with um, making sure that we're taking all these considerations into mind um, and uh, yeah. 
It's a, it's a, honestly, it's a loaded question because it's a big issue in publishing right now. I mean, you can read article after article, Twitter will go nuts over this issue. Um, my personal, the way I personally see it for, for my own work is that I only write characters from my own ethnic identity, you know, so whether it's white or, you know, Puerto Rican. And to be honest, even with my Latinx characters are always multicultural. You know, I don't want to ever pretend that I know what the Puerto Rican experience for a girl growing up in the Bronx is because that's not my experience. Um, but I do give a lot of other diversity to the minor characters in my books who are black and Asian and gay, lesbian, all of that, because I do want kids to see themselves on the page. Now, whether that is a hard and fast rule. I can say that the reason behind the movement, there's now a movement called Own Voices, hashtag OWN Voices. So Amor and Summer Secrets would be considered my Own Voices book, where you're just writing truly your ethnic identity story. Um, and We Need Diverse Books is a big organization trying to promote diversity in publishing. And the reason they're promoting um, people of color writing their own experience is because historically in publishing, it has been a very white industry. I mean, that's just facts, not just the authors, but the editors and the publishers and everyone making the decisions. So if there was a book that came out, you know, in the past hundred years that featured a black character, often it was written by a white author. Right. And what that did was, you know, editors would look at their fall schedule and be like, well, we already have a black book. We don't need another one. And ignore the fact that it was written by a white author and thus closing the door on a black author who's trying to authentically write their own experience. Mm -hmm. So um, Lee and Lowe is a publisher of children's books. They came out with a study in 2018 about the children's book industry. Of all of the books published that year, only 7% were written by Black, Latinx, or Native Americans combined. 7% of all children's books, from board books to young adult. And of the Latinx books out there, the ones featuring Latinx characters, only 34% were written by Latinx authors. So the fear is that by, you know, you know, promoting or publishing too many books as they historically have of authors who are not of that background, it's going to close the opportunities for authors of color. You know, so I don't want to ever say a hard and fast rule that you can't do something because there are probably a million examples out there of an author who did the work and authentically, you know, wrote a story that that was a good representation of that culture. But I just want people to understand the reasoning behind it. You know, so personally, my take on it is I stick with my own identity for the main characters, but then for the minor characters show even more diversity. Okay, yeah. Um, so diversity is, it sounds like it's just changing a lot in general. Could you speak um, a little bit to how you see your role um, in this like changing climate of writing and publishing? Yes, I mean, essentially now that I have a book out like, I want to open the door for more Latinx authors. And the biggest way to do that is if I write Latinx characters. So there aren't a ton of Latinx horror novels, you know, or horror movies, you know, where the multicultural character doesn't die in the first chapter or the opening scene of the movie. <laughs> So, you know, with small town monsters, you know, if it goes on to be successful, that will open the door for other multicultural Latinx authors to write in that genre and editors will be looking for more of it. And that's how publishing works. You know, you come out with a really successful wizarding books and all of a sudden people are looking for wizards, you know, vampires, they look for more vampires. So the more that I write um, Latinx characters and that book does well, it's going to hopefully open up the doors for more and more of that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so now I kind of want to get into some questions more about the business of um, mm -hmm. publishing in general. Um, so uh, you started off knowing um, not totally a lot about the publishing industry. Um, so I, I read in your bio that you, your journey was kind of like, you went to a library and you picked out a book about um, literary agents. And that's how you started trying to find um, agents to begin with. So I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, like, when you started looking for an agent, what like what was your most useful advice that you learned from that process? Um, and then afterwards, I kind of want to talk about. Um, so you've had four now, four literary <laughs> agents, um, and I'm just curious. Um, so how and why did you move from one literary agent to another? 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll start with the first question first, which is just <laughs> how you get a literary agent. So I knew nothing about publishing and it wasn't even an aspiration of mine when I was younger. You know, I was a journalism student. Um, I was actually a broadcasting major. So I was taught to write sentences of only 10 words or less. So like, I mean, it wasn't something that I intended to pursue, you know, so I went from journalism, then I ended up in PR for a nonprofit until I literally had a dream that I was a young adult author and I dreamt of the concept of what became my first book. And so I wrote the book and got to the end. I'm like, you know, it's not that bad, you know, like maybe, you know, I should try to publish it. And I literally Googled how to publish a book. And that was it. And this was way back, this was in 2006. So this was before like the internet was as big and useful as it is right now. And so yeah. back then, like I went to Borders, which is no longer even a store oh, and bought, it. yes, I missed Borders and bought the um, guide to literary agents and like went through with my highlighter and highlighted everyone that represented young adult. I had an extremely atypical querying experience for the first time where I only queried for two weeks and before getting my first offer of representation. That is unusual. You normally query for years. For those who don't know what a query is, I, I'll get into the nitty gritty of that probably a little later, but it's the letter that you send summarizing your whole book, almost like the cover letter of a resume out to literary agents. And they decide whether they wanna see your book based on just this letter. And it can take a really long time to make that happen. Now um, there are way more resources, you know, online to help you with that uh, that query process. But I can tell you that my first experience was just in the slush pile, like anybody else. You know, I just sent out my letter and waited for the response, sent out my partial, the whole thing, um, knowing very little about what was going to come next. Yeah, that process is is pretty insane. Like, how do you even yeah. imagine going from something so you know just just a letter <laughs> to where you are now um and so i can speak cool. to that in a, in a little bit about the letter if you want to go into that yeah um did you want to talk briefly about um uh the process of moving between the literary agents that you yes. have had? Okay. yeah so yeah i've had four different agents um which may seem like a lot but if you consider that i've been in the publishing industry for 15 years, you know, how many people keep the same job for that long, you know, it's not that dramatic from a work standpoint, but in publishing, it's a little unusual. Um, my first agent I was with for five years, um, and she is the one who sold Amore and Summer Secrets. Um, and she she's the one who picked me up for those first two books that didn't sell. So I was very lucky that she stayed with me after two failed attempts. Um, if you don't know, agents do not get paid. Um, they only make money if they sell your book. So once they sell your book, they get a percentage of what you earn, but you don't pay them a salary or you don't pay them for their effort. So they work for you for two years without selling your novel. They're essentially working for free during that whole time. So, I mean, I was very grateful for her that she stuck on, you know, until More and Summer Secrets went on to sell. Um, but then, you know, I kind of learned more about myself and grew as a person, you know, in my 20s when I signed with her. I, you know, thought the best way to make a business relationship was to become really, really good friends with the person. So they would like me so much that they wouldn't want to ever let go and like, you know, <laughs> yeah. so we became like super good friends to the point where I would get on the phone with her and talk more about our personal lives than we would my books and what I was doing next. Um, which would have been fine, but ultimately, you know, she went on to leave agenting. Um, and as she was sort of transitioning, her, she was just pulling back from all of her clients. Um, and so we all sort of left around the same time. And that was just to be expected. Um, after that, I so when I went with my first agent, it was just the slush pile traditional querying process. For my second agent, I had now already published three books. And More in Summer Secrets is a three book series. So I was able to reach out to a few authors that I had met along the way and get referrals to their agents. Right. And that is how I ended up getting my second agent was from a referral. We were together for about two years and she had tried to sell what became Proof of Lies, the Anastasia story unsuccessfully. And she also even tried to sell my very first novel. Um, and after those two failed attempts, we just sort of parted ways, just mutually. Um, 
So then I go back now, you know, I have, I'm in my thirties. I end up having a couple kids. So I kind of like stop public, you know, writing and publishing for a while. And when I decide I'm going to get back into it, um, I still really wanted to publish proof of lies. I didn't care that two agents had tried and failed. I still believed in this book. So I knew that it was going to be very difficult to get an agent for a project that had been shopped that extensively and rejected that much. So I only reached out to one agent who had been the intern for my first agent when she was in college. And now she was an agent in her own right. So be nice to everyone out there, people. You never know who's going to be in a position to help you one day. And she had read Anastasia Phoenix in its earliest draft. She had loved it. I reached out to her. I said, you know, it never sold. Would you want to work with it? And she did. And so we worked together. We were together for about five years. And that relationship ended in 2019. Um, you know, after those three books came out, Anastasia is also a three book series. And that ended for a variety of reasons. It sort of came to that exact same problem of what am I going to write next? And I came up with a, I, I wasn't even sure. Like I never talked to her about career goals or what I saw my author brand. It never even occurred to me. And so I sort of floundered around. I first tried to an idea that was going back towards a more in summer secrets. That was just contemporary YA. She didn't like it. I tried another thriller novel that, you know, she didn't like that either. And then I ultimately came up with the idea for small town monsters. And now I was kind of hooked. Like I felt like I had a good idea. I really wanted to do this. And she still was not sold on it and didn't want to do it. And that's when we decided to sort of part ways. Cause it was, I think we both realized it, I had hit a point where I was trying to come up with a book idea for an audience of one, you know what I mean? To, to please her. So then I got to my fourth agent and this is a great tip, you know, for anyone who's querying. I know I said, you know, the traditional publishing uh, method, but for my fourth agent, I actually found on Twitter, there's a, um, there are a lot of different pitch fests on Twitter throughout the year. One of the bigger ones is called PitMad, which is P-I-T-M-A-D, hashtag PitMad, um, an abbreviation for Pitch Madness. I logged on one day in September. I saw I had finished writing Small Town Monsters. I just started querying. I did not go for referrals at this time. I just sort of targeted agents that I knew of and respected. And then I get onto Twitter. I see Pit Mad is happening. You basically write a tweet that summarizes your whole book in, you know, there's two sentences. And you just put hashtag Pit Mad, hashtag whatever your genre is, hashtag YA, hashtag horror. You know, and if an agent likes your tweet, then that's an invitation to send them the book. Um, I had not prepared for this. So I sort of slapped up a tweet at like 9 a.m. And I got, I think, only four likes. Um, so four agents, you know, responded to it. Of those four, all requested the full manuscript and two um, offered representation. And so then having learned from my past experience, I had to like decide which agent to go with. And it was interesting because my first instinct was to go with the agent who was going to be my best friend. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like we, she was Puerto Rican. She lived in Cornell, which is where my husband went to school. And it would have been the same thing all over again. She had no changes for the book. The other offer was from a guy from New York who had a lot of, you know, some changes for the book and had a whole different conversation. It was all about career and vision and where we can go next. And I can see this becoming film and I can see you doing this and that. And it was such a refreshing take for me that I'd never had that that's the direction I went in, even though it was the choice of making changes, making edits and doing things differently. I felt like the first time I was going to get more career direction. And so far it has been awesome. He sold small town monsters during the pandemic, which oh, is wow. like nearly impossible. Yes. So it's been great so far. Wow. Okay. Um, I want to quick just ask about the tweet that you sent out. Um, how do you even begin to package an entire novel like into a two sentence tweet? Um, mm -hmm. Like, is that something that like you would be able to talk about briefly, just like how, how, how you can frame your novel in a short, like little- Yeah, package? I mean, they call it the elevator pitch. Um, which, you know, they want anybody to be able to do. If you're getting an elevator with Steven Spielberg and you've got the one ride to tell yeah. him your book, what are you going to say? Um, but in this case, for me, 
Um, I recommend, obviously you can't go enter any of these things unless your book is done and completely polished. Uh -huh. And then at this point, you should have already, your query letter should be done and completely polished. So at this point, you've already forced yourself to condense your book into two paragraphs because that's all you get in the query letter. So it's sort of then taking those two paragraphs and feeling like, now what can I do? Right. Um, what I recommend for anybody, there are several pitch fests that happen on Twitter. Pit Mad happens, I think, twice a year. It's one of the bigger ones. There's another one called DV Pit, which is, stands for Diversity Pit. So if you're a marginalized author, it's for people looking for those type of works. There's a whole bunch of them. I think there's ones for science fiction fantasy and that go there and lurk you know, read them, spend some time. See that That's basically what I sort of did that morning. I went on to PitMad. I started reading all of the ones that had gotten a lot of likes and how they summed it up. Um, oh. One of the things they ask you to do is to do that comp thing. You know what I mean? So I think my comp was like, it's the conjuring meets it. You know what I mean? I was trying, you know, you're trying to give some sort of perspective of it, but it's not easy. You know what I mean? But it's a lot easier to do once you've written the query. Yeah. Um, okay. So talking about the query then. Um, so I, I know you have to showcase uh, your platform um, in these letters. Um, so how do you how do you accomplish that? Um, and also, what what if you have no specific platform? How do you like figure out what that is to begin yes. with? Yes. So this is what I'm going to jump in and say, Jeff. If you could share that page from my website that has links for writers. Um, this will be a nice resource. I put a web page together with all of the resources that I used when I was first starting out and querying. Um, my biggest recommendation is there is, so when I started, there was a book and you know what I mean? That's what I was reading. But uh, now there is a website. If you see at the top under discussion boards, it says query tracker. Um, that is the number one resource. That's where you start. Okay, when you start the query process, not only does it list every single agent out there and what they represent, but it also has a forum where people post their query letters and other authors who are in the same stage and in the process, rip it apart. Okay, and tell you what's wrong with it and how to make it better. And that's how I started. It was a different website at that time, but it's the same exact, you know, thing. Um, go there initially and just like I said, lurk, start reading all of the queries that are posted on this forum and start to get a sense for what makes a successful query. Um, it's not just like my book is about, like you've got to start in the voice of your character. So like, you know, Vera Martinez, you know, never believe she blah, blah, blah. Like you got to really feel like you can write the back cover blurb of a book and that's what it should sound like. So after you've lurked for a while, write your query, put it up there and let some other authors rip it apart. Okay. And you know, it's, it's your first step in learning to accept some criticism, which you will get a lot of in this industry. And hopefully, you know, it'll work as for, so you get your cover letter. The first paragraph is just your intro to the agent and why you chose that agent. So you should be picking them not only because they represent your genre, because young adult is a huge genre, but also because they represent a book or an author who you think is similar to your own work. So do, do your research, find out who they rep, and they will be impressed if you say that. Um, then you summarize your book in two paragraphs. And then your last paragraph is what you said, your paragraph about you. So, I mean, if you don't have a platform, you don't have a platform, you don't try to sell it. I mean, don't make one up, you know what I mean? Like they're well aware that this is, this is a first novel for many people, but platform can be different things. So if you've written a book about a singer, for example, it, your part of your platform is that you have um, a background in music and you have a degree in the music school and you, you were a featured soprano or whatever, that gives you authenticity to write that story. Um, same with, you know, somebody who's writing a fantasy novel based on Jewish folklore, you know, put that in there that you are a Jewish scholar that gives you authenticity, even if you've never published anything, um, your degree, you know, if you, if you graduated, you know, from com, even though it's journalism school that counts, you wrote, you learned, someone taught you how to write, put that in there. I'm a journalism major. All of that counts. Um, towards your platform, but there isn't any expectation that you need to have some huge brand before your first book comes out. Okay, yeah, that's super helpful. Um, so I want to go um, back to kind of dealing with rejection that you talked about earlier. Um, so when you find out that something is not working um, after submitting a few times, how do you go about sorting out these problems and then tackling them? 
Yeah. So, I mean, my advice is if you only get, if you only hear this feedback once, um, so say you're, well, first, first things first, before you start the query process, you should get what we call beta readers, you know, so friends or family or somebody to read your book and give you feedback. Okay. Um, and that's up to you how well you know those people and whether you're going to accept the feedback. But once you get to say you're submitting your stuff to agents. Okay. So now you're getting professional feedback. Okay. If you, First off, if you're getting zero requests for your book, you know what I mean, you're, you're querying and you're getting no requests, that means there's something wrong with your query letter. So go back to the query tracker and start again. If you're sending out partials, which is usually the first 30 to 50 pages, and the same thing, you're getting no requests for a full manuscript, well, then there's something wrong with your first 30 to 50 pages, okay? So then go back, whether you can do it with fresh eyes because you've walked away, because ideally when you're querying, you should stop working on your book completely start working on something else. Okay, so if you have fresh eyes, go back into it. Um, if you can go back and get more beta reads, go back into it. Or if you are getting the same note over and over and over again. Okay, so if when I was getting some of those rejections for Anastasia Phoenix, one of them was, it felt like she's on a wild goose chase. You know what I mean? That the, the mystery felt too, there were too many coincidences. She stumbled onto things too easily. And I realized it was because I didn't yet know how to write a mystery. You know what I mean? I had put time into reading them, but not learning how to write one. And I had written the book the same way I wrote a more in Summer Secrets, which was not to outline. I just was like, oh, I'm gonna write it like a pantser. And you can't do a mystery or a thriller or anything, in my opinion, that has a lot of suspense unless you have a plot that's pretty well outlined because you need to know the motivations of your bad guy and what he's doing to achieve his goal in order for your protagonist to find his clues along the way. Um, so that's one thing. If you are getting the same feedback over and over and over, you should probably listen to it. Um, if you're not, you know what I mean? If you get this weird outlier feedback, you don't need to pay attention to it. I, you know, had an agent at that time who loved the first 100 pages of Anastasia and then thought it fell apart when it got to like the actual spy thriller part. And I'm like, well, the first 100 pages is like normal girl in high school. That's the part that every single editor had ripped apart. So I realized that this agent who had given that feedback was the outlier. You know what I mean? She was not into spy thrillers. This was not her genre. You know what I mean? And what she connected to was the contemporary stuff. So pay attention to who you're getting the feedback from. Um, um, even during this process, I had gotten feedback from an editor who was an adult editor of, of, of adult mysteries, and she gave all this feedback that I then made the mistake of trying to apply, even though it was just one person, and not realizing that she was adding, making it so complicated, which would work if it was an adult book for an adult audience. You had, you know, they may have expected this extreme level of police detail, but teenagers' eyes are going to glaze over at a certain point when you get too much into the weeds of that type of stuff. And so I ultimately had to undo all of that before this book ever went to press. So don't rip up your book off of what one person says, but, you know, do try to get it read widely and see if there's a consensus. Okay, yeah. Um, so just briefly, um, I'm just wondering because it sounds pretty scary, um, like going through all this rejection stuff. And I know it's part of the, it's part of being a writer and part of being an author, but mm -hmm. I'm just wondering like, how did you motivate yourself to keep moving forward? Um, and did it ever feel like, a, like it was too, getting too much? And how did you overcome that? Yes, yes. So during the seven years of rejections <laughs> for Anastasia Phoenix, and I tallied this one. So, you know, I have given keynote addresses to writers about rejection. You know what I mean? I think we had submitted it to 70 some editors, you know, got rejected probably by half of them. I made it to acquisitions 10 times. Okay. That's the meeting before where they take it to sales and marketing and they decide if they're going to make an offer. And out of those 10 times, I only got an offer once. So nine, I, nine times I got this close and got shut down. Okay. That's what kept me going personally. You know what I mean? was that I was getting some positive feedback. You know, I had gotten three agents based on this novel. You know what I mean? I had 
gotten a lot of um, editors and agents who read the entire manuscript from start to finish, which if you have any concept of how much these people read is, is a feat in and of itself and who offered wonderful feedback before passing. So I knew I had something, I just hadn't figured out how to tell it. So this first one, the last 100 pages of that book are almost exactly the same as the first draft. It was how to get to that point. So at the time when I was going through this rejection, I had opened up a fortune cookie and my fortune was nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. And I made that the wallpaper on my you know, laptop for years to like motivate me to keep me going. But I mean, there were plenty of times where I was ready to give up on this, particularly when I had taken that break to have kids. You know, anyone who takes a break to have kids going back into the workforce, you can feel like you've missed too much, you know what I mean? And no one's gonna yeah. want your voice anymore. So that was a time, um, if, if that one, agent, you know, who in turn hadn't um, wanted the book, I don't know what I would have done. So, I mean, I was kind of lucky that that happened for me. Um, if those first books that didn't sell, if my agent had dropped me after that, I don't know if I would have had the confidence in my 20s to keep going. Um, so I had some things happen to me that were lucky enough to keep me motivated and keep me looking forward. Even after when I broke up with my agent in 2019, you know, I was very disheartened. I was so sad at the loss of that relationship that there was a minute where I doubted the book. I'm like, it should I keep writing small town monsters? What if she's wrong? And what if she's right? I mean, what if what if it is going to be terrible? And so I, you know, swallowed, you know, in my, in my pity party for a week or two. And then I said, no, you know, I locked myself in my guest room and I wrote that book as quickly as I could. And it went on to publish. So, I mean, you never know what's going to happen unless you believe in yourself. You know, you, I always tell kids whenever I go to high schools and do like honor roll assemblies, I'm like, I can't teach you self-motivation. You're in this room because of the, of your own drive. And so just keep at it. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we're almost to the Q&A portion of um, this, but I, I just wanted to ask one more question before we move into that. Um, if that's okay, Jeff, let me know if we if we don't have time for it. Um, but I really wanted to know um, about getting to Random House because Random House is publishing Small Town Monsters yes. and it's your first big five. So I'm just wondering, um, like it sounds super exciting. and I'm just, It is, it um, is. Like, what was it like to work with Random House? Um, how does it differ from your previous publishing experience? Yes. So Amore and Summer Secrets and Proof of Lies were both with what we call indie houses. Mm -hmm. um, Amore was with a larger indie house, Kensington. Um, it, it does mostly romance women's fiction, but some teen. And they are distributed through Penguin. So I was in a bookstore, you know, for all of that. Same with Proof of Lies with Entangled, who is mostly a digital publisher, but they do their YA in print and they um, have a distribution agreement. So it was in bookstores. But I said, when I got the offer from Random House, I told my agent, like, I felt like a minor league ball player who's finally getting called out <laughs> to the big show. Yeah. Like I, you know, had been I in the too. industry. Yes, I had been doing this for like a dozen years to finally get to this point. And I think any author out there, any aspiring writer, Random House or any of the big five, Simon and Schuster, all that, that's the goal. That's the dream. Right. You know, that's what you want to say. Like, I actually did this now. Like, this is legit. Um, so I had the book hasn't come out yet. It comes out in September in a couple of months. So I can't speak to how like the the launch or that experience will be. I can say that um, the cover experience was dramatically different. Um, with both Proof of Lies and More and Summer Secrets, I had zero impact on my cover or my title. You know, like we we well what. Well, more in Summer Secrets, less than anything. I didn't get to see that cover or, and I had no impact on the title until it was done. And even with a minor thing, like the second book in the series, I wanted them to crop the picture differently, just tighter, and they refused. You know what I mean? Or, and take into account that the series is entirely about a girl who is fair skinned with red hair. And they put initially a girl with black hair and super tan on the cover. And I'm like, my agent was like, they poured salsa all over your book. Like, you know, like it wasn't the, what the vision I saw and I had no, you know, no say in it. Proof of Lies, they had gone through so many iterations of that cover and I never got to see any of them until they got to the final one. And thank 
thankfully I did like the final one, but when I was given a glimpse of the earlier ones, I would have been very sad. So with Small Town Monsters and Random House, I have been involved every step of the way. I got to meet the artist who drew the cover. You know, I got to fr be friends with him on Instagram. Um, he, you know, I got to give opinions. Like I think the, you know, Grim Reaper in the clouds should be a little more subtle. I like this color font and not this color. I want my name on the bottom or here. It was so much fun to be included and to see like black and white sketches along the way. So that's been the biggest thing. And even just a little thing like social media wise, and you, I think you all know authors need to be on social media. Right. I'm now follow, finding that all of these YA authors who I've been following and have been trying to you know, interact with for a long time are now finally following me back. You know, like, like it kind of bumped me up to a different level when that announcement came back. There was like a flood of um, more follows and more interactions with my social media than there was before. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Woo, hoping that I get there someday. Oh, yes, you will. Stick at it and persevere. I'll stick at it. I'll stick at it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Oscar, you're doing such a good job with this that I totally believe you're going to be successful at whatever you end up deciding you want to do. Um, and I hate, to, I hate to interrupt here. You, you've been doing such a good job with these questions, um, but we do have a ton that have come in. We had questions that came in during when people signed up for this. And, and one of those things that I think we all knew. Uh, Diana, you were going to be asked about was the self-publishing process. And even though you haven't had direct experience with that, Saskia, was there a question that you maybe had about self-publishing? Because several people have already asked about it in the chat and the Q&A even beforehand. Um, yeah, so I, I mostly just wanted to talk about a little bit. My Well, my specific question might be a little different. So um, if anyone has other questions, definitely put it in the chat. Um, I just was wondering kind of um, what made you choose traditional publishing over self-publishing and also how do you think that the advent of self-publishing um, and digital publishing has affected traditional publishing in general? Because um, I don't know much about self-publishing. Yeah. So it wasn't really a choice. Back when I wrote a more summer seeker, self-publishing wasn't a thing. So it was 2006. So traditional publishing was pretty much it. Um, in terms of now, I can say, so while I have never personally self-published a book, I did during that time when I was on my baby moon, write a couple of short stories that were put out ebook only with a micro press, okay, which was basically like self-publishing, okay, it was only online. And I can say from that experience, what I've learned is that different genres are way more successful at self-publishing than others. If you are a romance writer, and that's what you want to write, Self-publishing is amazing and you will make so much more money self-publishing than you probably will make traditional publishing. And that's a reason for that is that romance readers are voracious readers. They flip through books in like every two weeks. Yeah. They, uh, they read by trope, meaning enemies to lovers, mobsters, you know, you know, two people, one bed, you know what I mean? All whatever type of different tropes that are out there. And they don't care who wrote it, whether it's Nora Roberts or Saskia Denbone, like they will pick it up if it fits that thing. So there are certain, and I think a lot of genre writing horror has a, has a huge following, you know what I mean, with ebooks and stuff. For me personally, I found that young adult wasn't as successful as an ebook only venture, mostly because we are intentionally writing for kids. Um, while a lot of young adult is read by adults who have e-readers, -re e there are a lot of kids who don't have access to that technology. Um, I've spent a lot of time speaking at inner city schools. Um, and so I feel like if I were to write um, an ebook only YA novel, it limits it to kids who can afford a $100 to $500 device. So there are certain genres that are better than others. Um, do your research. So um, on that web page that Jeff shared earlier, at the bottom, I list um, writing organizations. Mm -hmm. There are There is a writing organization for every single genre out there. I am per personally a member of the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators, Mystery Writers, Horror Writers, and Thriller Writers, okay? But there's science fiction fantasy, there's RWA for romance, there's every genre has a society. I recommend joining it because there are people in there who will be able to talk to you about self-publishing. There are fantastic chat groups. There are really active local communities, you know, for just, for example, Eastern Pennsylvania, you know what I mean? So it's just Philadelphia. And I can go to physical meetings or virtual meetings and get access to people who know a lot about self-publishing and who can teach you the tricks of the trade. And I will also warn that um, 
while self while there are hugely successful self published authors, they are spending money to make money. Okay, so you don't have to pay to get traditionally published. You know, your like I said, your literary agent works for free. You know, your publisher pays you in advance. All of that for self publishing, you've got to be prepared to invest some capital in um, advertising, in editing, in cover design all of that. If you just um, have your nephew make a cover and you put it up on Amazon, it'll it'll be read. I mean, if what you want from your experience is to have an event at your local library, to, to have a, a book for your friends and family, to have the sense of accomplishment that I wrote a book, that's, that is one avenue of self-publishing. If what you want is to make a lot of money, you're going to have to spend money to advertise on Goodreads and Instagram and build a social media presence and join all the associations, go to the conferences and meet the people who can get you to that level. I also just want to mention, uh, Diana, that page that we've shown a couple of times on your website is super interesting. I did put a link to that in the chat. So everybody, if you want to um, make sure you take a look at the chat, you can link to Diana's website right now. Um, do that. We're also going to include that link in a follow-up email that we'll send to everybody uh, in the next couple of days. Um, Diana, I think you touched on this a little bit. But I, I might have been busy uh, looking at all the questions and chats that have come in. But Saskia, I think you also had a question just about kind of like diving in and the finances, like the financial implications of like deciding yes. I want to be a writer. I'm going to do this professionally. So I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But Saskia, what was what was your question about that? Because other people have, have kind of weighed in with similar concerns. Yeah. So um, obviously, I mean, my two career options at this point are musician and writer. So <laughs> both of those are a little scary financial um, issues wise. And um, I know that you, especially when you started out, had a lot of different jobs going on at once. Um, I, you were teaching, I think. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, and see what your input was on how you manage your finances, um, especially like when you're getting into the, the publishing industry. Yes. Um, and how do you balance uh, other jobs at the same time as trying to become a full time writer? Yes. So um, the secret is that most authors out there have a day job. You know, what I mean, they do not exist purely on the money they make from publishing. Even with a deal from Random House, I would not be able to exist purely on the money from publishing. So currently right now, I also teach creative writing for Johns Hopkins University okay. um, Center for Talented Youth. I also do consulting and writing um, tutoring on the side for some of my former students or aspiring writers who are want feedback on their manuscripts. And so, so technically I have three jobs right now if you add in my own books. Of those three jobs, none of them provide health insurance. So that is my biggest thing that I that I try to scream from the rooftops at every chance I get. If I was not married, I would have zero access to healthcare. Not from you know my consulting, not from Hopkins because I'm part time, and not from my publisher or agent. So that is a huge barrier, and that is one of the reasons that there is um, a gap in marginalized authors versus. Um, you know, white authors is that barrier to get into the industries because they don't have the backing of their parents to take a job in New York City that's $30,000 a year, you know what I mean, to, or something like that. So that, that's one. So most authors have a day job. When I wrote Amore and Summer Secrets, I was working full time for the Philadelphia Education Fund. You know, so I had a full time nine to five job. And I wrote my first three novels while having a full time, you know, job. So a lot of authors will talk about how early they get up in the morning to write. So um, now that I'm in a pandemic and I'm a mom and I've been dealing with virtual school for over a year, I had to become a mom at 9 a.m. So I've been waking up at six o'clock in the morning to write up to work on my books up until 9 a.m. There's something on Twitter called hashtag 5 a.m. writers group. And these are authors who get on at 5 a.m. every day and encourage each other. You woke up today, you did this, and they write before they go to their day jobs. You know, um, there's authors who do it the other way around and stay up until two o'clock in the morning to write. Um, the other thing that I currently do, like I said, I'm in you know virtual school with kids, is I basically lock myself in a, my guest room for an entire weekend and write for two days straight and give up my weekends entirely to do this. So you've got to be willing to, to give up your free time is the, is the sad case in point. Um, but you do need to expect that you're going to have to have a day job um, either for to financially support yourself or um, to provide the health care if, you know, if you are a single person. And that's a 
sad fact of, of the industry. Now, I will say, you know, my first jobs were writing, you know, so I was um, a journalist, so I got to write all day, every day. And that's not a bad gig to have when you are trying to work on your novel. You know, I would spend my lunch hours writing, you know what I mean? Like, and I, that, that was, so it helped me hone my craft. Um, you know, I know a lot of students go into publishing, you know, try to get a job, a small press and get in the door that way. So at least they're surrounded by books. Um, or get a job at a literary agent. So they they were a lot of literary agents are authors themselves. So, so sort of get into the industry in a periphery way that'll give them a little more stability as they work on their own projects. This was awesome. I'm so glad I got to just kind of be a fly on the wall for this conversation. Um, thank you to you both. I, I wanna wrap up with a couple of things. One, um, I put this in the chat. Um, so many of you have actually asked um, super specific questions about kind of like your book project. And I know um, as generous as Diana is with her time, we could be here for a whole other hour. So long story short, um, a great way to follow up with you, Diana, is on social media, right? And it seems like you're super open to people continuing to ask you questions. Yes, I feel free to reach out. And actually, I know we had discussed a lightning round. So I wanted to go in really quickly to lightning round some of the genre specific questions that I got. So like, picture books. If you're trying to publish a picture book, join the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators. There is a local chapter in your area. There are people who will be able to tell you how to get a picture book published. You do not need to draw the pictures yourself. Authors and illustrators are completely different, but you do need to find an agent. And that process is very different than my own personal experience. So I can't give too much advice there other than to tell you to seek out authors in that association. Someone had asked a question about memoirs, same deal. There's an author in Philadelphia, her name is Beth Kephart, K-E-P-H-A-R-T. She is the memoir queen. She teaches at the University of Penn. She has written several young adult novels, but also memoirs and teaches workshops on memoirs. She teaches at Penn on memoirs. Seek her out, read her books, join her workshops. That will help you. Academic press or nonfiction is utterly different than what I do. So nonfiction is based entirely on your platform. Um, if you are an expert in, um, you know, my brother-in-law is an expert in the ethnomusicology of heavy metal music. You know what I mean? That's what will get his book published is, is being an expert in a field. Um, so that is, you kind of query agents of nonfiction. If you're going for popular nonfiction, that is for the mainstream audience and you write a proposal, you don't write the whole manuscript. Um, anything from chapter books, middle grades, young adult, memoir, and novel of any genre, you have to write the entire book from start to finish before you query an agent. And the process is similar. Nonfiction is the only genre where you write a proposal, which is a whole different animal. And obviously, academic nonfiction is a whole thing in of itself that requires peer review and a PhD and a whole lot of expertise that I cannot steer you in. <laughs> We got a question from Tracy in the chat about cookbooks. Do you have any specific, specific advice about that? No, I do know that literary agents represent cookbooks and I am blanking on a friend of mine from BU who wrote and published a cookbook about Mexico and I wish I could plug her right now. Um, but no, I do not have that experience I, I, about how to publish a cookbook. I would seek out other people who, who are more versed in that genre other than I know this particular um, friend of, what's it? Leslie, Leslie Telez. There you go. Leslie Telez wrote a cookbook about Mexico. Okay, she's married, so she may have a maiden made a name, a married name, but her authenticity was she had lived for years in Mexico and wrote a whole street, you know, book on Mexico. I also have a friend in the area of Philadelphia who wrote a cookbook about tahini. She has a tahini uh, company called Sum Foods that works with all these restaurants, which is an ingredient that's in hummus and stuff. So she had this whole thing to lend to the cookbook, but it's a whole different process that I can't really steer you in. Again, this was awesome. I, I wish we could keep going. We are up against our hour here. I actually want to direct the last question to you, Saskia. Um, I'm curious to know if anything that you've just learned in the last hour changes any anything in your mind about writing or you know your future. I think the biggest thing that it has changed is just my excitement, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I already loved writing, but I'm just feeling extra motivated right now, and I'm probably going to go take a I think an hour break before my next class and get working. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's awesome. And like I said, anybody who has additional questions, feel free to 
um, reach out to me if there's something more specific and I will help point you in the right uh, direction if I can. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I think we lost you for a second there, yeah. but um, I, the, okay. you did such a great job today. And I know uh, in terms of, uh, you've got people now all over the world, BU alumni that are rooting for you uh, to be <laughs> successful. So thank you, Saskia. Thank you, Diana. I also, I just want to wrap up by saying you met, uh, Saskia, you talked about the Career Advisory Network, and Diana, you had volunteered to be helpful to other alumni and students who wanted to ask you questions about your career. The Career Advisory Network has actually um, been upgraded to something called BU Connects, that you can see that over my head. So BU Connects is now our new online platform for uh, networking and mentoring, and people like Diana around the world, um, 10,000 people, in fact, have joined BU Connects Many of 78%, uh, so whatever that is, 7,000, nearly 8,000 alumni like Diana have raised their hand and said that they want to be helpful to others in some way. So I want to make sure that all of you today um, uh, join BU Connects, either as, offer yourself as a mentor or somebody who's willing to help, or just go there yourself if you're looking to make some connections in your industry, if you're looking to make more connections in publishing. Um, go to buconnects.com. Um, my pro tip for you is that you can sign up with using your LinkedIn information. You can sign in with your LinkedIn username and save time, get your profile up and running. You can be networking in minutes or offering yourself as a mentor. Um, so um, thank you again to both of you. This was fantastic. And I'm really glad, uh, Diana, that this was your good suggestion to do this. Uh, I'm so glad we were able to do this. And I hope it was super helpful for you, Saskia, and for everyone Definitely. watching. And feel free to follow up with any questions that you might have. Thanks again, everybody. Bye. Have a great Bye. day. Everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.